Welcome back to Clean Skies Sunday. While scientists, legislators, and entrepreneurs try to find ways to lower greenhouse gas emissions and transition this country to a low carbon economy, one group of scientists is trying to lower the temperature of the planet in a very different way and much faster. Jeff Goodell is best known among many for his book, Big Coal. He's also a contributor to the New York Times Magazine and a contributing editor to Rolling Stone Magazine. His latest book is called How to Cool the Planet, Geoengineering and the Audacious quest to fix the Earth's climate. Jeff, it's so good to have you back. Thanks for having me. So geoengineering, this is a concept that is about actually manipulating the temperature of the Earth. Right, trying to deliberately, uh, intentionally manipulate the, the temperature of the Earth's climate. We're already doing it now by dumping tons of, millions of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere every day. We're trying to think about now ways of actually cooling it off, of, of getting better at engineering the Earth's climate. Okay, so intervening this time to improve improve the Earth. Let's talk about some of the ideas being developed, and one is uh, actual machines that sort of suck the CO2 right out of the atmosphere and sequester it. Right. There's a, a number of scientists, including one at the University of Calgary in, in Canada uh, named David Keith, a physicist who I looked, uh, who I spent some time with for my book, who actually wants to build a, a kind of carbon-sucking machine that will actually pull CO2 out of the air and then allow it to be sequestered or buried underground. So it's not done yet. Do we know what it would look like? Well, there's some, some visual representations of it. They're large industrial looking facilities. And I need to underscore that these are still very expensive yeah. ways of doing it. It's still in the very early days of this. Probably won't be economical commercially for a couple of decades. But in the long run, it gives us the idea, it gives us a tool for actually modulating the CO2 levels uh, of the Earth's climate. And I compare it to a kind of iron lung for right, the planet. Right, right. Okay, so another idea is to, to almost mimic a volcano and actually uh, inject uh, some kind of dust into the atmosphere. Right. And it's a very simple idea that does actually mimic a volcano, except that it injects dust, perhaps sulfate particles, different kinds of very small, tiny particles high in the stratosphere that act like tiny mirrors to reflect away some of the sunlight. And all you have to do is reflect away one or two percent of the sunlight to have a, a, a quite a large impact on, on the uh, Earth's temperature. So the uh, eruption that happened over Iceland is good for climate change? Well, er eruption over Iceland is not really big enough to have much of an impact so far. Okay. Um, we'll see how it plays out, but right now. Okay, another uh, scientist is Stephen Salter. He's a Scottish engineer. Um, this, is, this is about spraying water into clouds to brighten them. Right, it's about, use, it's about he's built these machines that can uh, shoot salt water up into certain kinds of marine clouds that changes the density of the clouds, making them brighter so that more sunlight is reflected off the tops of them. And you can use that to cool the planet in the same way that the sulfur particles do and also cool areas, regional areas. This is just amazing stuff. Now, now this book is, is largely about the characters themselves, these scientists. So tell me about these guys. Well, these, a lot of these scientists, you know, when I first started this, I thought that this was a very crazy idea. And the, the journey of the book is basically my coming to discover that this is not a completely crazy idea. It's partly crazy mm -hmm. idea because this is, there's no, this is not a simple, quick fix. There's many problems with this. There's many unintended consequences, perhaps. But I went to meet some of these scientists, like David Keith at the University of Calgary and Stephen Salter, very serious people who are very concerned about the situation that we're in, that we are moving into an era of dangerous, of high risk of dangerous climate change, and what might we do if we had to cool things down in a hurry. So it's not a quick fix kind of solution, but you do talk about it in your book as sort of a... A, a way to avoid catastrophe or an emergency measure. Right. So if we've figured out, for example, that um, uh, the ice was melting in the Arctic even faster than we know now, we know it's going very fast, but if we knew it was even going faster and decided we wanted to do something about it, what could we do to actually stop the melt? Putting sulfur particles in the stratosphere or using these cloud brightening machines to change the amount of sunlight that hits the Earth is one thing that could possibly actually stop the melting of, of the Arctic. But so something temporary and then we go back to the, you know, the kinds of emissions cuts that we're developing now. Right, right. but uh, it's really important to underscore that reflecting sunlight away is not a substitute for cutting emissions. It doesn't cure problems like ocean acidification, many yes. other environmental problems. But it is a kind of backstop technology. But you do say that um, the cutting of emissions, the different moves that we're taking right now have been so far largely a failure. Right, and I think one of the reasons that geoengineering is sort of percolating quite quickly to the top of the discussion about this is because of the political failure 
uh, to do anything in a collective way about reducing emissions. You know, well, there's a lot of talk about green technology and things, but that we haven't really done much to lower the CO2 levels in the atmosphere. What about the political implications of these ideas, though? I mean, it could, could it be that politicians or others will glom onto these ideas as a way to um, try to continue burning uh, fossil fuels or the dirtier fuels? That's a very real risk, and if that happens, that will be um, a very bad thing because this is not a substitute. There's many political risks with this. Uh, one of them is that you know a, a rogue nation or lone actor, someone on their own, this is simple enough and cheap enough, really, from a technological point of view, that someone, a country, a China and India, United States, could do this on their own, and it'd be... The question becomes... With good intentions, though. With good intentions, yes. But it and, could be damaging. But it could have all kinds of consequences that we don't know. And so there's a lot of questions now in international policy debates and things about how you would stop a rogue nation or right. someone from doing this. There's also this. ecological impacts. I mean, the, the, the idea of deflecting sunlight, uh, this could affect um, food supplies. It could. It could affect it profoundly by shifting precipitation patterns, shifting the monsoons. By when you, when you change the thermal balance of the earth, the distribution of heat between the oceans and the land, you can change rainfall patterns, and that could have a huge effect. Wow. But I mean, of course, going into this... Uh, this is like manipulating the weather and, and, I mean, huge implications. Right. But, th but this is not like, you know, building condos in the Virgin Redwood Forest. We're already screwing with the planet. Right. We're already heading into a, a time of severe risk of all of these things. The question is, can some of these geoengineering technologies reduce some of the risk that we're of this era then? Um, and if so, they're worth exploring. Well, seeing how, just how in their infancy these are at this point, how likely do you think, even eventually, some ideas uh, of these sorts will be implemented? I think it's inevitable. Really? I think that, you know, I don't think it's inevitable in the next decade, and I don't think it's inevitable maybe even in the next two decades. But in the long term, you know, one physicist that I, that I talked to early on for this book said to me, um, Manipulating our environment is what human beings do, oh. and I think that that's what we're going to do. So maybe the risk of not interfe intervening is, uh, is greater. I think that there's certainly a case to be made for that. Um, so, so actively managing the climate, you think that it, it is, is not all a bad thing given what humankind has done so far? Yeah, I mean, I think we've done a pretty good job of screwing things up, and I think <laughs> we've done a pretty good job of being apathetic and uh, not understanding the, the real risks that we're, that we're running with continuing to dump CO2 into the atmosphere. And I think that, you know, if there's a reasonable chance that we can get better at understanding this and that we might need some of this in order to, uh, you know, blunt some of the risks of catastrophic changes. I mean, nature doesn't really care about us. You know, if we're going to thrive here on the planet, we need to be to do a better job of managing this place. Yeah, I mean, everyone talks about saving the planet. The planet's going to be just fine. It's, right. it's, it's, uh, it's life on Earth that we want to uh, talk about. Right, right. All right, Jeff Goodell, the book is How to Cool the Planet. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. We appreciate it.